Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Environment Infrastructure Committee meeting of the 20th of March. I'm going to remind councillors to use their microphones and ask everyone to ensure that all mobile phones and other communication devices are in <coughs> silent mode. Are there any apologies for today's meeting? Convener, we have apologies from Councillor Angus Forbes and he's being substituted today by Councillor Ellingworth. Thank you. Any declarations of interest in respect of the business on the agenda? Yes, I, I want to declare a non-financial interest in respect of item P1, uh, the private business session, uh, since I'm a trustee of Perthick and Ross Heritage Trust and I'll leave the chambers uh, when that item comes up for discussion. Thank you. Uh, I too have a financial interest in the Heritage Trust and I too will leave uh, at that item. Thank you. Thank you. We have a request to address the committee of deputation in terms of standing order 72. The committee is asked to consider a request for a deputation from Andrew Warrington and Carol Duncan, trustees of the Octorada Community Bus Group. Can I have the committee's agreement that Andrew Warrington and Carol Duncan, trustees, be allowed to address the committee? Thank you. Can we agree the minute of the meeting of the Environment and Infrastructure Committee of the 23rd of January? I will now invite Andrew Warrington and Carol Duncan to address the committee for a maximum of five minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vice Convener, uh, for giving us the opportunity to make the deputation today. As you've said, I'm Andrew Warrington. I'm current chair of Octorada Community Bus Group, and I'm joined by Carol Duncan, who's secretary and one of the founding members of the group. Um, we, we go by the name of ACBUG, which is slightly sh shorter than saying the Octorada Community Bus Group on each occasion. We were formed in response to community requests for enhanced public transport services within Octorada. Uh, Carol and colleagues undertook a community-wide survey in autumn 2017, which identified clear needs with difficulty accessing the health center and the hospital and some residential and social isolation being two of the issues that were highlighted. So our discussions internally within the group was how would we address those transport needs. Um, ACBUG viewed it very much that this was an opportunity for the community itself to begin to try and find its own transport solutions to the problems in Octorada. Um, given the current financial circumstances the council faces, we didn't think it was appropriate or uh, understandable that the council itself would fund a major new transport issue in the town, so we decided to try and look at ways that we could deal with it ourselves. Um, as a result of that, we became a charity, we got charitable status, which then allowed us access to apply for various grants from trust funds and from various public sector bodies and, and community transport bodies. Um, the focus of our group is community development. What we're all about is trying to allow the residents to participate in community life and equally get access to the services that most of us probably would take for granted day in, day out. Um, we engaged with the Council's Public Transport Unit and we've had a lot of support from them and other experts and concluded the best way of trying to address the needs that we'd identified was to provide a town bus service uh, using a professionally licensed PS3 bus operator rather than <coughs> going down probably the community transport route and trying to do it on a voluntary basis. However, funding non-commercial bus services is an expensive activity, as people on this committee will be aware. Um, and we could potentially face a cost of up to £100,000 a year subsidy to operate that bus service. To ensure we get best value from what we're trying to do, we've actually gone through a procurement process. It's not a requirement of a charity to tender the transport services we're looking for, but we thought that it was appropriate to do that given the level of funding. Um, and it may not come, for those of you that know me, it may not come as a surprise, we based a lot of our contractual conditions on those used by the council. Um, 
we want, and that also gives us some contractual control over the operator in terms of the vehicle they use, their um, cu customer care and things of this nature. We've tendered various routes and timetable options. Um, for us, serving the existing residential areas to the south of the High Street in Oxford is the key issue, and that is where most of the residents live. However, we've fully incorporated the three new housing developments at Castle Mains, Kirkton, and Town Ed into our specifications. It will provide, the bus will provide regular links to the shops, the community facilities, St. Margaret's Health Centre and Hospital, and our bus services. Um, We've applied for a number of funding sources, which is obviously highlighted in the report, including NHS Tayside's Community Innovation Fund, whilst we've got a number of other funding applications being prepared as we speak. Achieving sustainable funding for this bus service is a focus for our business plan in the years ahead. We are fortunate that we enjoy a lot of community support, uh, including from the health centre, the hospital, Community Council, the Oxford Network, and our elected representatives, and we're grateful for that. Uh, indeed. Um, providing a town bus service will be a flexible solution. The routes, the timetables can be changed in response to passenger feedback, operation experience, serving other parts of the town. As there's further houses built, we would look to try and see if we can accommodate those within the bus route and addressing just general new community demand. Um, given the expansion of Oxrada, whilst addressing social needs was our key issue, the other benefit of the town bus services should facilitate modal shift and reduce some of the local power traffic in and out of the centre of Oxrada. Um, if the funding for, for the, from the Oxrada Community faci Facilities Fund is successful, I can assure you we will spend the money wisely with our focus on providing an efficient, cost-effective, community-led transport solution for Oxrada. Thank you very much. It's the first time in 34 years I've got <laughs> managed that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Now I will invite members to ask questions. And remember, this is questions to Andrew and Carol, not making an opinion. Councillor Robertson. Uh, thank you, Andrew. That was it, it's certainly a very exciting project. Um, have you got an idea of what sort of income the bus service might bring in once it's up and running? And will it? Will it be self-funding or will you continually need further funding once it's established? The simple answer to that is we don't know. Um, I, I would, and I'm a, you know me well enough, I'm a positive person. I don't think this bus service probably will ever be truly commercial because of the nature of the public. A lot of the people using the bus will get free travel, which is subsidised by the Scottish Government, so it's not full fares. Um, but our expectation is that with good usage, the level of subsidy will be reduced substantially over a period of time. And we'll try to build that into the contract as well, that we begin to get some of the benefits of the income that generated over the first two years and subsequent costs in years three, four, and onwards. But I think there will always be a need probably for some form of subsidy. It's a supplementary. Um, as, as you know, uh, other areas of Perth and North are looking at trying to introduce our community bus service, we're looking at it in Kinrosha just now. Um, would you both be prepared to come back and give us an update maybe in a year's time as to how, what sort of progress you've made? Would that be possible? Absolutely, no problems with that whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we'd be happy to meet any other group that's trying to do something similar out with committee. There's no problems there at all. Okay, thank you very much. You've I will now ask Alistair Finlayson to introduce the report. Thank you very much, um, Vice Queen. I'm here with I'm Alistair Finlayson. I'm here with my colleague Margaret Roy from the Council's Public Transport Unit for the report. Uh, the Oxford Community Bus Group has applied for £150,000 from the Oxford Community Facilities Fund. It's for setting up and running a town bus service, and the committee is asked to determine this application because the amount sought here is higher than may be determined under delegated responsibility. The town of Oxford is undergoing major expansion and the Community Facilities Fund was created to provide community facilities for the town as development progresses. Public transport services are within the meaning of community facilities under the terms of the fund. 
Now, based on the rate at which house building is estimated to continue, the fund will be able to support this request and also support a range of other projects in the future. Thank you, Vice Convener. Questions on this report? No questions? I think no questions means that people are um, content with the report. So I will, with your permission, I will um, move the report. Dr. Adger Community Bus Group is a charity and has applied for 150,000 each way over the four year period towards the Otter Adger Town Bus Service. The applicant carried out a community survey to establish that there would be a demand for the service and to find out where the service would be most needed. When asked, the locally elected members in the community council gave the support for the application and their views need to be taken into account when determining the application. Income projections indicate that the fund could support this application and would still be able to support a range of other projects. I therefore move the paper. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Simpson. Any, are there any comments on this report? Councillor Parrott. Thank you, Vice Convener. Um, just to say, I think I'm, I'm, I'm fully behind this um, proposal and um, I, I, I wish it every success and, and as part of that hopeful success I, I hope as, as has been discussed that um, um, the operators of the bus can report back um, as to their progress and that we can if you like learn the lessons that they learn in running it um, because it may well be applicable in other communities in the future for us so I would I would hope that we can um, in a sense um, wish this project success in its own right but, but learn every lesson we can from it as a trial because it may be applicable in other places. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? No? Are you happy to agree the report? Yes. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> thank you very much, Andrew and Carol. Wish you well and hope you'll come back and tell us of the success. Thank you. Okay. We now move on to paper five. Of paper five, which is the per cycle network master plan, and I'll just allow others to leave the room. And we'll ask Mike Morgan to introduce the report, please. Sorry, thank you for that, Vice Convener. Okay, uh, in 2015, Perth and Kinross, uh, Kinross Council developed and approved the Perth City Plan. And this outlined this vision of Perth as one of Europe's great small cities, which subsequently secured a commitment of uh, just under £14 million pound capital. And that was split between placemaking and lighting for investment across Perth and Kinross. One of the key strategic outcomes of the Perth City Plan uh, big move five is placemaking and the delivery of an accessible hierarchy of streets and routes in Perth, which helps tackle air quality issues and delivers high quality spaces and places for people, leading to increased dwell time and ultimately increased localised spend. In order to set a framework for investment in sustainable transports, Perth and Kimberley Council developed a cycle master plan which outlined eight strategic routes which link current and future settlements within the city centre. On the back of the master plan, the council has identified a number of funding opportunities via Sustrans and the Community Links Plus programme and ERDF grants, which has the potential to signif deliver significant parts of the per cycle master plan over the next four to five years. Are there any questions on the report? Councillor Lane. Thanks, Michael. Um, I, think we've had <laughs> I think we've had two meetings with this, and uh, the work you've done is really good, and I wish you a lot of success with, with taking it forward. But just in a public forum, I'd ask that I'm still disappointed that um, the cycle network stops at Lunkerty. 
when there's a well-developed group in Stanley wanting to take it that bit further on. So my question is, will you work with the Stanley Development Trust moving forward to ensure that we have a cycle path coming from Stanley to join up with the Lunkerty uh, section? Thank you for the question. Yep. Uh, just in terms of the master plan and development, I guess we have to focus on a certain scope. Uh, and for the first instance, we looked at Perth and tried to extend as far as we could in terms of uh, growing settlements, uh, Bertha Park, Lunkerty, et cetera. We are aware of the developments in Stanley. We're also aware of developments further out, uh, like sort of Blake Gowrie, Kapurangas, we're developing other cycle schemes, and we're looking to link them to those in the future. I guess we have to draw a line at a certain point uh, for the purpose of the master plan, but we are engaging with other parties uh, through uh, our Stephen group, but also uh, through the likes of colleagues in road safety, and also, uh, for instance, a new uh, cycle forum which has just been set up, I think the <coughs> Perth Active Travel Hub, which is set up to kind of support the council in its developments going forward. And I know there's members on board that forum, which again link into the uh, Stanley development. Thank you. Councillor Parrott. <coughs> Thank you, Vice Convener. Am I correct in my understanding that here we are uh, agreeing, if you like, in, in principle? the taking forward of the scheme, but, but that further papers will be introduced in future with regard to the detail of, of the specific proposals as, as, as they move forward and, and, and the funding hopefully is secured for them. Thank you. Uh, yep, that's the uh, case we're looking at. So just uh, in terms of outline program, we submit the business case at the end of April to such runs. We have a presentation to undertake early June and then we should be notified of the result at the end of June itself. So I would like to think that by early July, we should be in a position to hopefully take forward initial proposals. And what we look to do then is set out our program for uh, co-design and engagement with the public and our proposals that we develop and over the coming months coming back to this committee. Thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Simpson. Thank you very much, Vice Convener. Uh, Mike, I've noticed over the years that um, cyclists and, and cycling are not always universally popular. Uh, I try not to take that personally, but uh, have, can you give us an idea of any work we're doing to ensure that um, the message goes out that, that, that we are not anti-car or, or, or anti anything else, this is just a, a, an extra and that cycling will be good for the community. I mean, you, you, you reference here the, the Living Streets um, report on, on the pedestrian pound. There are other benefits that will go from this that other people will benefit from, not <coughs> just the cyclists. Yes, thank you, Councillor. Uh, there's a significant amount of research and data which shows that the benefits of active travel, uh, aside with the uh, living streets, the pedestrian pound, you've also, such ones do a lot of it themselves, but Transport for London recently came out with a very good uh, bit of research to show that people who actively travel actually spend up to 40% uh, more with local traders, uh, for instance, within a month than people traveling by car or using a car. Now, you know, we're very clear that the, um, the impact the car has for Perth in terms of service in rural communities. The purpose of the master plan essentially is focusing on short journeys. So the routes themselves, that's, and that's why it kind of links in with Lankety at the moment. Uh, up to the 60% or over 60% of everyday journeys are within five miles. So that's the kind of predominant focus we have at this point in time. Uh, of that 60%, over 70% are within two kilometers. So what we're saying is that we recognize that the car has a purpose for the longer journeys, but our focus is for the, the communities and the people of Perth, essentially. Thank you. Any further questions for the bike? Thank you, Vice uh, Convener. It's uh, about, you mentioned earlier that uh, some of the funding was coming from the European Rural Development Fund. If that funding is going to come off and we're hoping to try and expand the system, where, where are we going to get the additional funding from to, to, to uh, expand the scheme? In terms of the, just to answer the question, in terms of the ERDF funding, that forms part of the Green Infrastructure Fund. And we've been given reassurances that that is uh, committed, regardless of Brexit, uh, up until 2023. 
So the application went in uh, the end of January and that was for 2.4 million. What we're going to do as part of our business case, we'll uh, establish where we stand in terms of our total match funding pot. And then depending on the funding decision comes back from such funds, uh, we will address our proposals accordingly. So we're going to go in as big and as bold as we can, but the reality is it all depends on the funding we have to work with. And then that's, again, we'll come back to committee outlining that. Thank you very much, Mike, for answering those questions. Are there no further questions? If there are no further questions, I will move the report. This report outlines the context of developing the Perth Cycle Network Master Plan in relation to environmental and transport pressures along with community, health and business benefits. The report seeks approval to integrate the development of cycle networks within strategic planning and placemaking guidance. This will support funding applications and the development of detailed designs using resources from the Council's capital programme to leveraging significant match funding from external funding sources. This should deliver improved cycling and transport infrastructure to support economic growth and environmental sustainability. And we look forward to hearing the outcome from the bid for Sustrans later this year. I am happy to move the paper. Do I have a seconder? Happy to second, and if, if I may, with your indulgence, Vice Mayor, just take a moment to to pay tribute to the amount of work that Mike Morgan has put into this report. Mm -hmm. If his responses to my emails or anything to go by, he works seven days a week and most evenings, and we're indeed lucky to have him and his team uh, working on this. And I look forward to a successful rollout. Thank you. Are there any comments on this report, Councillor Robertson? <coughs> Uh, thank you, Vice Convener. Um, first of all, I have to say that I agree with uh, Councillor Laying about the, the, the link between Munkerty and Stanley. It's a pretty unpleasant cycle for anybody to, to, to use, so I think it's really good if we can actually um, link villages like Stanley, which then links on to other parts in, in further afield in, in Persia. It'd be good if we could actually do that. But I just, um, I think this is such a good news story, this, this report. It, um, it says all the things you want to say about Perth and Ganos. It's a place that is a, becoming a really good cycling friendly area and um, this, this report is evidence of that. And if it makes it easier for people to use their bicycles um, to get into the city, then that's all to, to the good. Um, and I'm sure that once the cycle network is fully set up, people will take advantage of it. The one reason that people give to me about why they don't cycle is because they don't feel safe. Um, so I think this, this report goes a long way to try and address those concerns. And lastly, can I say, um, council officers often get a hard time, and, um, <laughs> but council officers, council officers are actually in a position, and we've got one who's, um, this is the last committee today, but that council officers are in a position to actually um, have big effects on the quality of life that people enjoy in this area. And I'm delighted that we've got officers who take that opportunity to, to, to work on projects like this and to actually make a, a, a really big difference to, to the area we live in. So I think we should, be, we should be grateful to them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Willie, for these comments. I'm sure the officers will appreciate it. Councillor Parrott. Thank you, Vice Convener. While I'm not an avid cyclist myself, I wholeheartedly um, welcome these proposals here, um, and not least because this to me represents um, the first project that sees the Cross Tay Link Road not merely as a solution, but as an enabler to other things. Uh, and I look forward to um, other, pro other papers in the future um, that also um, see the Cross Tay Link Road as an enabler as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Lane. Uh, I too would like to thank Michael for, for all the work he's done on this and I hope that this isn't the, fina the final situation and that we, we can move on and spread it out further. And I look forward to him coming back after the summer to tell us how much money we've uh, achieved. I don't want him coming back to say that we're looking at an alternative approach for not being successful. But if we aren't successful, I'll not be down to the lack of effort and work put in by the officers on this project. Thank you very much. Councillor McCall. Well, I'm 
echoing the sentiments of councillors uh, already gone before me, but um, I also wanted to highlight that I think this is excellent from the fact that we are offering a choice to the residents around um, Perthshire and uh, Canrosshire, especially around the city centre. And taking on board what Mike has said, I, I've been behind this from the start. I think it's an excellent proposal. But equally, with these short journeys, if we're actually offering a choice to people to come out their car, I think that really needs to be highlighted, and I think it's an excellent piece of work. Thank you. No further comments? Well, I'm, it's, it's really good to hear that all the comments have been very positive, so I take it from that. We're all happy to agree this report. to paper six, road safety projects assessment criteria. This is something that's um, dear, to, dear to us all, so I shall ask Daryl to introduce this report. This report proposes an assessment criteria to help the traffic and network team prioritize the large number of traffic management and road safety schemes requested by elected members and local communities. The assessment criteria would include road traffic collisions, casualty severity, road environment and alignment, school travel planning program, sustainable transport links, cost of scheme and land availability. This will enable us to calculate a cost benefit ratio and rank the schemes accordingly. The assessment would not include those initiatives already agreed by the ENI committee for which budget resources have already been committed. Such projects include vehicle activated signs, the A977 mitigation measures, new rural footways, Puffin crossings, green routes, and the cycling, walking, and safer streets program. As local authority, the Perth and Kinross Council has a statutory duty under the Road Scotland Act to record, investigate, and mitigate road traffic collisions. Combining this with the national casualty reduction targets, our focus should be directed towards those traffic management and road safety projects which will help reduce or eliminate the risk of collisions between the various road users. Our resources need to be targeted where there is the greatest need rather than the greatest demand in order to develop safer, healthier communities. The assessment criteria set out in this report will help the traffic and network team to deliver this objective. Councillor Robertson. I was going to be very surprised if I were. <laughs> um, thank you. I think um, the, the one question I've got to ask was, there is a big, will, will this actually free up time to actually progress the work that's actually currently in the system? Because one of the big problems is when, 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 when people like me speak to officers, they say, um, there's, we just don't have any manpower to actually take this forward. We've no manpower to drop this thing. We agree it should be done, but we've got no no um, ability to do it. So is that going to help to move this log jam forward? I, th yes, I think Daryl. there are a number of answers to that, uh, Councillor <laughs> Robertson. One, there's reference to the additional staff resources contained within the report, but also by developing the, the website and letting communities and elected members have access to the list, they'll be able to see for themselves where their project projects rank within that. At the moment, a lot of our time is taken up in consultation with uh, members of the public and with the elected members, and it would be good if, if people had more access to the information. I think, um, I'm quite happy to have access. I think it's really good to have access to the information, but will we actually start to see progress made in actually bringing some of the things forward that have been waiting to get done for, for years and years and years? That's the question. Will it speed things up? will speed things up because, like I say, the additional staff resources and the additional budget resources will allow us to deliver. Barbara wishes to. I think you know, sort of, we also have to take into account, you know, sort of the, the, the purpose of, of the, the, the database and making that publicly accessible is to allow people to understand fully where they are in a very long list, you know, sort of, and that will be prioritised if you approve that criteria um, this afternoon. The issue will always be, you know, sort of as well as the staff resources, and as Daryl points out, we've recruited 
four more UNICEF people over the course of the, the last year and a half, two years, um, to support this. But there, there is a finite pot of money. So, you know, sort of we will move as, as quickly as we can, um, undertaking the consultation and the necessary works that we need to do to, to d deliver any scheme. So we are expecting it to move quicker, but we will still not be able to address all 500. Yeah. Councillor Daly. Thank you, Vice Convener. Um, I wanted to start by saying I welcome this report, I welcome the data-driven approach, and I um, welcome the transparency this will bring. However, my question is around the, um, the scoring that's attached to the, um, the casualties by type. So within the paper, we've got um, one for a slight injury, two for a serious injury, and three for a fatality. And my concern is whether this gives us the right sort of differential between a slight injury and a fatality. I want to ask officers if there was a particular reason for going one, two, and three, or whether there are other approaches used in other areas. Thank you. Uh, the most common approach is what we have used here, which is identifying it as a one, two, and three. Um, while casualty reduction is a primary focus of the report, uh, we're also looking at reducing the risk as well. And we know that at some of our uh, more serious and, and fatal collisions, that the road environment may not have been a factor. Uh, most, most reported incidents record several contributory factors, and the most common category is driver error. What we need to be careful is that if we rank some of the, the more serious injuries at a higher level, that with the focus directed to them, uh, that perhaps the road, that there's very little that we can do to change the road environment. However, the one, two, three scoring is uh, a guideline not a regulation and it should be amended if, if that is considered to, to be appropriate. But we should also be aware of the fact that we have a number of sites where we have several minor incidents, any one of which could have been more serious depending on trees or weather conditions. And a site that has several collisions, uh, we need to focus on that because there's enough data there to be able to establish what the, what the factors were, what the patterns are. So you know, this is what we call lower severity doesn't mean that the site is any less important. <coughs> Thank you. Quite happy with that answer. Good. Councillor Lane. Uh, thanks, Vice Convener. Again, it's on the scoring system uh, for the collisions. It's using Police Scotland's information, uh, which is massive <coughs> gaps in it when it comes to, to, to minor uh, incidents, especially in rural roads. I'm sure all the local councillors will know of a corner or a bend where there's many cars go off the road, but none this will not be showing up in, the, in this data. And uh, I was wondering if there is any way that any sort of local knowledge can feed into this. Um, the, the example I always have is in one ward where I was trying to get a piece of work done and the police had only two recorded incidents in five years. And there was five in a week because of road conditions, and it's trying to get the, to fill in the gap. I, I think there is a gap there. Uh, Councillor, there, there is scope for that with, within the report. Uh, it's in Appendix 1. What we have found since 2013, Police Scotland no longer provide us with information on damage only, or on injury incidents. Uh, but we know from <coughs> being on the road network, there are numerous locations where there is evidence of vehicles leaving the road. Uh, and one under the collision category criteria uh, in Appendix 1, it says that where there is evidence of damage only incidents on the road, if we can see damage to property, vehicle debris, if there are skid marks on the road, uh, or if the police or local community are able to provide us with information, that that will count towards the scoring. One of the difficulties we have, though, is being able to rely on the information because it's not supported by a, a report from the police, we have no indication as to weather conditions, time of day, vehicle direction. So we need to be very wary whenever we're, we're looking at that. But we, we have tried to accommodate that as best we can by giving one point for each damage only incident that we can assess. Okay. Councillor Williamson. Thank you, Convener. Uh, you say in um, 1.14 you've had uh, 500 requests or schemes that, which are currently in the backlog. I was wondering if it's possible to break that down. Is it through um, uh, road signs or um, uh, road safety measures that need to be put in place in, in, in what we want? Is it possible to break that down? 
this might take some time to break down this. <laughs> well, it would. I don't have that information to hand at the moment, but that's made up of traffic regulation orders, uh, the time when there's marking, when there's the approval of initiatives to do uh, traffic engineering projects, <coughs> vehicle activated signs and parking and crossings, which are not currently on the list. Um, um, but we've talked about five or six different categories of work, mm -hmm. uh, that would all be able to Yeah, uh, picking up on Councillor Lane's point about uh, rural communities and the roads and, and having local knowledge, I, I, I do support, we do, think, do feel we do need to have some sort of criteria put in place to, to put support um, the, the, the a limited budget, but and I, I wonder if there's some role that the action partnerships could actually play within you know, forward looking and uh, supporting the role of the traffic officers and whether that might be a way of, of trying to, to uh, identify what their priorities are within rural communities and whether that could be implemented within the criteria. I don't know if Daryl's got any comment on that or not. I think um, Keith would like to add something. Uh, th thanks, Vice Governor. Yeah, I think the, the issue that we're trying to um, deliver here is something which is, as is, is, um, Councillor Bailey was saying, data-driven evidence-driven um, um, information. I think um, Daryl's um, response to the last question was, was very pertinent in terms of um, local intelligence around actual incidents, um, but being very mindful that um, we, we kind of need to separate what, what sort of um, uh, opinion is versus uh, actual evidence. And I think, um, we again, we need to be very careful about um, uh, a level of community interest in um, road safety issues, which might not be um, as high a priority as road safety issues, which are happening in other parts of Perth and King Ross. So I think the, the focus for us is around the evidence, but if action partnerships can help identify key areas where there is evidence of um, collisions or damage, etc., I think that would be helpful. But I think we've got to do it on the basis of evidence as, as opposed to opinion, Councillor Williamson. Okay. You mentioned about uh, external funding within the reports. Um, uh, if, a, if a community group can find external funding to try and support some road safety initiatives, therefore, how are they? How can they get uh, uh, get access to funding when most funders actually consider that this is a, a statutory duty for the council to do, and therefore will not support a community group to get external funding to support road safety measures? So it, it seems like. We either try and get empower these action partnerships to try and uh, uh, do some sort of preventative agenda, or we're at a, we're at a brick wall, I suppose. Keith, thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I, I do agree. Um, there is there is this challenge around external funding and external funders um, in terms of mm -hmm. organised funding. Sometimes have a challenge around funding things which are seen to be council services. What we're saying in terms of this data-driven list is. These are the things that we can do within the finance and resources that we have. Anything below that, basically, we would be unable to do with the current level of budget. And I think there has to be a, a kind of change in perception around those things which are community-led, community-driven, community-desired for, for um, funding. And um, taking that on to um, the, uh, the funders to say, well, this wouldn't actually be delivered by the council because we only have so much funding available. And there's other means of fundraising as opposed to going to um, establish funding. So if a community was so um, exercised, they could um, um, organise their own fundraising themselves. But I appreciate the point you're making, Councillor Williamson. It is a challenge just now because um, certain funders do not fund things which are perceived to be the council. And I think in this new age of um, community empowerment, I um, think, yes, Perth and Kinross offer, I think that's one of the issues we need to challenge going forward. Thank you. Um, Councillor Duff. Thank you, Vice Convener. Uh, I very much welcome the proposals contained in the report. My question was about, um, you know, once the priorities have been listed with the, the projects, how often will the figures be refreshed? Or, you know, if, if some of the figures change, for instance, the casualties, will you be aware of that instantly? And will that amend the priority of the particular project? Darryl, yes, please. Uh, Councillor, as new requests come in, uh, they would be added into, if you like, the bottom of the list to be assessed, and either on a monthly, 
obviously a bi-monthly basis. We, we would review those and slot them in accordingly, depending on where they were ranked within that. At the moment, in regards to the casualty data, we currently work to, to each calendar year, because that's what Scottish governments do, and, and the statistics are published per calendar year. So at the end of each calendar year, we would then review the data. Um, but if there was a particular incident, or if the police had, had brought to our attention that they had concerns about the road environment, uh, it would be prudent for us to, to, to investigate that and therefore waiting until the end of the year. <laughs> but I think uh, I mean, rather than doing it each month as the new data comes in, we would be looking at it year on year. The report makes reference to us using a period, a uh, five-year period from 2013 to 2017. That was because when the report was being prepared, we only had the full calendar data up to the end of 2017. The December 2018 data is imminent. Uh, we would be expecting that to be coming in any time. There's usually a delay of two or three months to allow the police sufficient time to investigate each of the incidents before they're made public. Um, so as part of the, the, the assessment for this, if the report is approved, uh, we would have the opportunity to use the most up-to-date information for 2014 to 2018. Thank you. Just a, a wee follow-up on that. So would it be a kind of rolling five-year yes. uh, period of figures? I, I think it would be, yes. <laughs> we would want to use the most relevant and up-to-date information that we could. Thank you. Councillor Barnacle. <coughs> Thanks, sir, Vice Convener. I, I'm actually wanting to further explore Councillor Williamson's point. Paragraph 2.5, which deals with um, the benefit-cost ratio and pointing out that obviously if further additional funding can be identified by a community council, for example, uh, for a, a, a road safety project, it, it's likely to get a greater priority. So picking up on what you said, Keith, about uh, some funders don't fund things they think are council responsibilities. Is there any way we can get some guidance on that? Because going back to a previous paper about the transport fund for Old Tarada and the, the number of funds they were able to access for their project, it seems to me it's a similar situation with road safety where the council, because of the situation, can't, poss can't prioritize a scheme that the community may think is worthy of consideration. I just wonder if we could get a bit more clear idea of uh, what funders are on out there for road safety projects. Is that possible? Keith. Um, the council produce on a regular basis, I think it's monthly or bi-monthly, something called the funding alert, um, Councillor Barnacle. Uh, and within the terms of the funding alert, it sets out the criteria. Um, when we're talking about funders who don't fund things which could be considered as council services, the one I think about is wind farm funding, which I'm um, quite familiar with in, in the Highland Board area. There may be funders who, who again, would, would take that view, but I think the information would be contained in the funding alert around what funders actually can and cannot fund. So I think that would probably be covered by that. Thank you. Councillor Reid. Thank you, Vice Convener. It's obviously going to be very difficult to collate the evidence uh, of damage only, non-injury collisions on the ground. And I just wonder if there could be a, a hotline set up to allow uh, motorists to report their own individual situations that could take, uh, have pre uh, questions about time, date, uh, well time and uh, road conditions, etc., weather conditions that they could self-report. Um, Daryl, do you wish to make some comments? Oh, Keith's going. Sorry, you off the hook. <laughs> Keith, thanks for uh, Councillor Reid. Um, I, I think a hotline as in terms of the resource, might be a bit resource intensive if, <coughs> if members of the public have issues with um, things which they, they feel the council can deal with. Um, with the customer service centre and they would advocate using the existing mechanism through the customer service centre um, as opposed to a, a, a new hotline. Um, but certainly I think we could look at um, the types of questions we could ask of the public, taking on board the point you're making, so that the, um, we can trap that information and um, pass it through to our traffic and network colleagues um, to help form a view. Thank you. I, I mean, I think otherwise a huge amount of information will just disappear up into the, the cloud somewhere. Then we could use it if it's in the cloud. 
Are there no more questions? Daryl, thank you very much for answering members' questions proper, thoroughly, and I'm sure that they have learned quite a bit today about the way we go forward. Okay, so I'm happy to move the report. The committee will see that the traffic and network team delivers important traffic management and road safety schemes across the council area in line with annual targets, workloads, and available budget. The team continues to receive a large number of requests which are difficult to deal with efficiently and effectively while endeavouring to complete their current and future agreed workloads. The committee is asked to approve assessment criteria for prioritising road safety measures. It's important to note that the report does not simply propose the creation of a waiting list. Any subsequent requests, once assessed, will be ranked accordingly and may be placed higher on the list than some existing sites which have been on the list for some time. I am happy to move the paper. Do I have a seconder? Happy Councillor to second, Vice Convener. Councillor Duff. Okay, open up for comments. Councillor Bailey. Thank you, Vice Convener. Um, I do have an amendment. I wonder if that could be distributed, please. Um, and I think in brief, the amendment is, um, is really to change the scoring criteria. It's to change it from a one, two, and three for slight, serious, and <coughs> fatal, and change that to a one, three, and a five, because okay. I take on board fully what Daryl mentioned about not creating any outliers in this data set. And so therefore, the amendment, the final line there, gives officers the, the <coughs> scope to be able to down rank or adjust the scoring in cases where a fatal or serious accident where the police report confirms that the road design wasn't a contributory factor. So hopefully that addresses Daryl's concern in response to my question earlier. And um, I'd hope that um, I'd find support amongst my colleagues to do this. And the motivation is really to make sure that um, fatalities and serious injuries are appropriately dealt with um, relative to the slight injuries. Thank you. Okay. To ask if you have a, a seconder. Sorry, sorry, Andrew, some of people... Sorry, my apologies. Um, I'm, I'm um, happy to second this um, amendment. Um, I understand the concerns about not overrating um, a fatality, but at the same time it concerns me slightly that a fatality um, can score, if you like, less than the road environment in the, the itself, and, uh, and I welcome this um, re-emphasising to a degree of, of casualties to, to one, three, and five, as opposed to one, two, and three. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> Anyone else got any comments they wish to make? Councillor McCall. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going by um, sort of basic knowledge of, of driving. Um, I do have a concern that uh, a road could be actually a very difficult, a very contentious, and very unsafe road, but never actually have a fatality on it. Um, and I'm, I'm slightly concerned by increasing the the number of the uh, attached to a fatality, we could end up with a driver error being the fatality, and it could skew the information that we're receiving um, quite, quite, quite hugely, actually, um, in comparison to the fact that we could end up with a, a massive amount of issues which make the road itself unsafe rather than the fatalities that have been on it. So I have a concern in that respect. Okay. Perhaps we can ask um, Daryl for his comment on... Sorry. You read the last piece for me. Yes, I'm just going to ask Daryl for, for his comments. <coughs> I think as Councillor Bailey has explained, the wording at the bottom of the amendment allows us to take into consideration uh, the concerns that Councillor McCall has, has stated that if it, from the information that is supplied to us from the police, if we're able to establish that it was driver error, it was not due to the road environment or the weather conditions or the road layout in any way, then that that could be downgraded. We would need to put a, a comment onto that effect within the report, within the project folder, to explain uh, that scoring system. Um, but I trust yeah. that that answers the yes, question. Yes, my, my concern is that when you, start, when you start doing something like that, then you it becomes 
an opinion more than a, a, a standard, and I would be I would want it to be a standard so that it was met across the whole of all the roads everywhere and for every officer that would be looking at the assessment is, I guess, where I'm coming from. Councillor Lee. Um, I agree with the amendment because obviously everything is an opinion. It will be a police officer's op opinion. And so you take the best opinion you, that you can have to this. It will certainly not be opinions of people here in their driving uh, knowledge. I think that it makes perfect sense to have five points for a fatality because of the caveat that's been put in there, where it will be professional's opinion if it was driver error or the road error. So I, I think that to, to make it only a one point di difference or if you have three bumps with nobody hurt, it's the same as having a fatality. I don't think there's enough differentiation between the seriousness of the accident, so I support the amendment. Okay, thank you. Well, sorry, Vice Mayor, I just had a comment to clarify that. Contained within the police reporting system, uh, it is the police officer investigating the incident who highlights whether it is likely, probable, or unlikely. So the decision about whether it was driver error or whether it was down to the road environment is taken by the police rather than by the transport officer. Are you quite happy with the one three and five process for you to work with? It seems to be Vice Convener, I am happy with that. Okay. Well, I am ha following on from what Darrell has said, I am happy to accept the amendment presented by Councillor Bailey. Is that agreed? Good. Thank you. Right, we'll open it up for comments. Oh, sorry, that's it. My brain's gone. <laughs> right. Next paper, we have the school exclusion zone. <laughs> so we have got Lachlan, who's going to introduce the report. Thank you, Vice Convener. Um, school exclusion zones have been trialled at four locations by Perth and Canoss Council um, to make streets outside schools a safer and healthier place for children. Their purpose is to remove non-essential car trips from outside the school gates and encourage pupils with their parents or carers um, to travel actively to and from school. In order to assess whether the implementation of a school exclusion zone would be appropriate across Perth and Kinross, the pilot was under undertaken at the following schools. So we've got Arngask, Burrelton, Cooper Angus and Lunkerty Primary Schools. Um, the traffic regulation order um, for the trial has now come to an end and Perth and Canoss Council needs to create a traffic regulation order for each of the above sites if these are to continue. Um, the committee is asked to decide whether these zones should be retained. Okay. Are there, thank you very much. Are there any questions for Lachlan? Councillor McCall. Thank you very much. Just falling off the end of the desk. Okay. Um, it's actually regarding um, comments that have come back regarding displacement of cars, Lachlan. Um, I, I just want some reassurances. As much as I like the idea of a, an exclusion zone, and I do very much like the idea of people walking and cycling to school, um, how much of, a, of an issue do we actually have? Are we actually stopping people getting into their cars in the first place, or are we actually just taking the problem and moving it out with the zone that we've, we've sectioned off? I think a mixture of both there. Um, I think people have been encouraged to walk and cycle to school, um, but I think there are there are displacement issues, um, but we've tried to dilute that as best we can. Um, so if you take Lunkerty, for example, um, th there are cars that have gone out with the zone, um, and there is a perception that there are a lot of vehicles parking on Marshall Way itself. Um, I've been out for a site visit myself, and to be honest, I, d I didn't feel that the, the situation was overly bad there. Um, we have also put infrastructure in in Lunkerty to encourage people to, to travel more actively to the school. So they could park out with the zone and then either walk or cycle into the school. Um, so at Lunkerty we've put in two new shared use path links to the school um, which has tried to encourage um, people to, to, to walk and cycle. Thank you. Councillor Donaldson. Thank you. Can I go straight to page 104? 9.3, the very last point, and it's to ask uh, Lachlan, uh, when the, uh, the you anticipate bringing a further report to committee, 
how many schools do you anticipate might be covered by an extension of the school exclusion zones, both in Tarsha Kenosha and in Tarsha City? And also a key point is the criteria you're going to apply, because I think they have to be much um, harder than apply with just 20 mile an hour zones, which we're coming on to in a minute. Uh, on Gask and Glen Farg, there's obviously zoning issues with uh, Greenbank Crescent, but the key one, it seems to me, is Cooperangus. And if you look at the report, it states there has not been the res desired reduction in the number of vehicle movements or increase in the number of pupils walking or cycling to school. It is hoped that this can be achieved with greater enforcement of the zone. Now, these are school exclusion zones, so how can we achieve greater enforcement, in particular outside and around our schools? Thank you. I think it's about having the infrastructure in place to encourage people to, to, to walk and cycle. Um, so in Cooper Angus, um, we're proposing to do um, work on the common there, um, which would link down to Largan Park, which would give people the opportunity um, to, to walk or cycle into the school. Um, regarding enforcement, um, we've been in touch with um, Police Scotland as well, um, and they've said that when the, the, the zones are, when, when the traffic order is in place and they're able to enforce them, um, they will um, do that. So can I just come back as a supplementary on that? Thank you. That clearly lessons have been learned from these four initial exclusion zones. When do you hope then to come back with a further report on how many more additional school exclusion zones do you anticipate? Um, at the moment, um, we're not sure how many more we, we would recommend. We'll have to do it on a case-by-case -case basis, evaluate all the sites that are available, all the schools. Um, there'll be some locations where we're not able to put a school exclusion zone in. So if you consider the likes of a uh, Canoe Primary School, that is not suitable for doing one. Um, so if it's on a main trunk road, um, we have to consider very carefully what we're going to do there. We also need to make sure that, it's a, th th that there's a large enough area or there's a suitable place for other people to be displaced to. Um, so if we want to introduce park and strides, um, that's something that we need to consider as well. Um, so we will evaluate all the schools that we have in Perth and Kinross um, and come back to you with a, a further committee paper. It will probably be um, after the summer recess that we'll do that. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Vice Convener. Uh, it's back to Lunker to uh, Lachlan. And I believe you'll have been quite a bit of consultation with the Community Council. I don't see any uh, they were expecting that their opinions would be uh, featured and they would have a chance to, to comment in the, the response. I don't see that there. Uh, I'm, talk I'm looking at the, the, the number of people who've responded. Mm -hmm. Now it looks great in percentage terms. It's 11 people. It's 11 households out of all there. And the displacement around there where the paths that you do have to link in are on a corner, a bend, where people have to go out and overtake on the other carriageway to get past them. So what people are complaining about is if they come down the road towards the school and you've got 20 or 30 cars parked on a corner, which the community council thinks should be double yellow lines anyway. I don't think, I don't know how you make people respond to <coughs> your, your questionnaires, but we're basing all this on 11 households that have responded. How do you, do you think that that is all we can take as a representative view or should we have the community council's opinion on this? I mean, it's difficult to uh, um, get people to reply to, to questionnaires. Um, we did a letter drop and, and we gave every householder within the zone that opportunity to reply. We also went to the parent, um, contacted the parents via the, the, the primary school. Um, so in Lunker A, they used the text message service, um, which was very successful. And um, when you actually looked at the data from the survey results that we got, um, we got a very quick hit um, with replies. Um, we also, in Cooper Angus, we used uh, Facebook to get replies. Um, the issue with using Facebook was that you're getting um, responses from non-parents and we were actually looking for parents to respond to the questionnaire. Um, we've also looked at the WOW data, um, so that's um, the Living Streets software that's put into the schools, so that tracks how people are actually, or how the children are travelling to school. Um, so I think we've, we've used a lot of data where we can. I mean, we can't force people to, to, to do a survey. Um, I mean, we've given everyone that opportunity. If they want to comment, they were given that opportunity to comment. And can I just a supplementary? How enforceable is it at, at Lunkery? Because it seems to be there's very little enforcement of the, the measures at the moment. 
I mean, that's for the police to comment. I mean, the police have been out at Lunkerty and there has been enforcement there. Um, but as I've said, that the, the, the order has now lapsed for it, so we can't do enforcement at the moment. Um, so moving forward, um, if you wish that zone to be retained, um, there is a commitment there from Police Scotland um, to undertake um, enforcement there. Thank you, and it's actually um, by coincidence picking up on the enforcement point. Um, the, the paper states that we'll ask um, Police Scotland to look into this, but the, I wondered whether it's legally permissible for a local authority in Scotland to contribute money to police funds in cases where we would like them to do specific enforcement actions. Just really a technical question as to whether that is feasible. I'm not proposing it for this today. Thank you. If you would like to answer that question, Daryl Sheikh of Youth Peg, <laughs> Martin Keith. I think that's something we can be, can be looked into. Maybe no one, not the profit. Yes, it's a comment. Yes, yes. Thank you, Vice Convener. Um, I, I recognise in all of this that there are um, inevitable issues of enforcement, but I think the imposition of the school ex exclusion zones um, you know, sets a tone and, and declares an intent, and, and, and they can be useful. My concern, if you like, relates to paragraph 3.3 .3 on page 96, um, and, and that's about the business of authorised vehicles being allowed access and egress to the restricted area. I just have a concern that the normal day-to-day -day life of residents should not be impacted um, by these measures simply because they live in a, a school exclusion zone. And um, I suppose it's not really a question, but my question would be, um, is the permit system um, sufficiently flexible to ensure that the normal day-to-day -day life of residents is, is not impacted? And I would express the hope um, that the permit scheme um, is so um, to that degree liberal. Thank you. Thank you. If you'd like to answer this question. Yeah. Th thank you, Vice Convener. Yes, we can um, yeah, certainly give that um, um, reassurance to yourself, Councillor Parrott, that um, there is a, 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 a kind of flexibility in terms of the permitting that if uh, people have a genuine need to get to one of the properties, so for example, a carer, um, then um, that, would, that would certainly be part of the permit system. So this is not designed to stop people in their households um, living their normal lives. It is, is as you said yourself, uh, about tone and intent um, around, around schools. Uh, and perhaps maybe to respond to um, the previous question, um, this is about young people's safety. It's also about um, active travel. And I, I think a, a lot of the um, information from the report demonstrates that there's a, a, an increase in, in terms of the, the active travel. Um, I, I appreciate um, um, Councillor Lane's point around some of the shortages of data in, in Lachlan's point about, well, we can't force people to, to come back with answers, but um, certainly the majority of the parents, the majority of um, the head teachers and, and um, the, the, the users, uh, uh, sorry, the residents have indicated the support for, for this, this scheme. So it's kind of a bit of a, a broader picture right across the board, and I, I don't think we can lose sight of the active travel and um, safety for young people um, element of this. Thank you. Lachlan, Daryl, one of you got something? Are you quite? No? Keith answered the, the question. Okay, we have now the final paper. Um, Councillor Dugan. Thanks, Vice Convener. Um, it's a, a helpful presentation, and I think we can see from the tone of the report and the information in the report that it's been a difficult thing to um, deploy and trial and gather data from, but nevertheless, I think it's been done very well under the circumstances. Point um, seven in the recommendations request that the director, Deputy Director brings back um, a further report recommending additional schools, and I think Lachlan touched upon that, that would be hopefully after the summer. I wonder if we could have it emphatically after the summer. Yes, indeed, Councillor Dugan. Um, it, will, it will be the, the autumn, when all the committees in the autumn. Okay, okay thank you. Councillor Robertson. Thank you. Um, the only school I really know about is, is the one at Arden Gask. Um, you're recommending 4.9 that we, we investigate the expansion of the zone to cover Greenbank Crescent. Um, am I right in saying there's just two, two requests for that extension, given the percentages? And um, what is your view uh, as officers about this, the extension to cover Greenbank Crescent? 
Um, Green Bank Crescent was part of the original proposal, um, but the Community Council at the time decided that that wasn't something that they wanted to progress with. Um, so we went for a bit the, the, the shorter zone or the, or the smaller zone. Um, I think it would be th there is merit there um, in, in having ho the whole of Green Bank Crescent covered um, because at the moment you're getting a lot of vehicle, it's a very tight space up there. Um, so you're getting a lot of vehicle movements, people dropping off, um, and the local residents are saying that you're, you're getting cars parking in silly locations. Um, so I think there would be the opportunity for people to park down on the main street. There's been a lot of work done down there with paths linking into the primary school. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's about um, giving people that option as well. Um, the road down on, on main street is, is wide. It's a nice wide s section of road. Um, so there would be the opportunity for parents to drop off there and it's right outside the, the main school gate there. Okay. Councillor Simpson. Thank you very much indeed, Vice Convener. Th this is indeed a, a, an excellent report. I think that Blackburn and others should be congratulated on bringing it forward to us. But uh, it, it's a good news story and I think we should perhaps be concentrating on educating the parents rather than majoring on uh, enforcement. A note on page 95, 1.2, there's an excellent report entitled Children Who Walk to School Concentrate Better, which I thought everybody would know already. Um, and there's other information like this. The, the worst air quality around the school is in the back seat of the car with the air conditioning on. It's not the kids who are walking or scooting or cycling to school. And I think there's a, a bit of education to be done there. Whether that is beyond Lachlan's remit, I don't know. I think the council should, I hope the council would have some plans to, to take that on board as an education exercise of air quality and road safety and concentrate and concentration of the children rather than worrying too much about enforcement. And it's, uh, that's so, well, sort of a question. What, do we have plans to do that, to, to have an education uh, programme on this? Well, I would hope that parents and our edge now know how to take the children to school. And we are encouraging <coughs> them, doing everything we can to make sure that they do park further away from the school and walk. So I think safe to say there's an ongoing programme trying to educate everyone how it's safer. Well, I think we can, all, we can all put that message out then, I hope then. Can we? I have a, a, wait a Okay. Well, thanks, Vice Convener. I think it's a, a very valid point, Councillor Simpson. I think it's something we can maybe work with education colleagues. I mean, they, they, they do a lot of bulletins and briefings, etc., to parents. And if we can give the succinctness of that message as you've just articulated, I don't see it as too much of a, a stretch in our resources to produce that message, convey it through the schools, and hopefully win hearts and minds, as well as obviously as we've discussed about the enforcement element as well. Um, Vice Convener. Um, I'm on page, um, where am I on page 113. There's a very interesting summary of, of, of WOW data. And uh, Living Street's an excellent organisation. Uh, re recently, Councillor Dugan and I had the pleasure of meeting a large, a large plastic foot called Strider at Letham Primary School, where the, the kids there seem very, very keen on, on, on active travel. And I just wondered if there's any plans, again, to roll out the, um, this WOW uh, program to other schools uh, within our community because there are some as, as Lachlan says that will not be able to to have exclusion zones but we can all walk to school at least once a week I would hope and do we have plans to promote this scheme as well in conjunction with Living Streets who are happy to come up with inflatable feet and various other things to help us. Yeah, there, there are opportunities there. Um, and like at the, the school exclusion zone um, sites, um, we also had the iBike officer who was involved with the schools there to encourage um, kids to, to walk and cycle more often. It's, it's basically what we're looking to do is get the kids to travel as actively as they can to the school. We acknowledge that there are um, rural hinterlands at some of these schools that people, that, that the kids will not be able to, to walk and cycle. Um, so they will be traveling by public transport to the, the, the schools. But people within the villages, um, they should be encouraged as much as they can to travel as actively as they can. Um, other work that we've been doing is um, we've got the air quality monitor that can be taken to the schools um, and there's an opportunity for the children um, to see um, the pollution levels um, before and after. Um, so that's something that can be done through the iBike officer. Um, we, we got money through the air quality grant to allow us to do that. I think it is really to point out that there are a number of schools already, you know, sort of um, not just the schools mentioned within this report that already do, you know, sort of the active, you know, sort of um, travel, the wow stuff. I don't know how many times um, I must have watched, washed, 
a, a new badge every week that my son got for his walking to school, you know, when he was at primary school. So, and that's in Bergowrie, you know, sort of, so they're there, you know, and we'll maybe try and get the detail um, to, to um, build on Keith's response that, you know, sort of, as I say, there are a huge number of schools, I think, already involved in the scheme anyway. Oh, quite happy with the answers you've had. Lachlan, thank you very much for answering. Oh, sorry, Councillor Jarvis, very sorry. Have your name down here. <laughs> thank you. That's one of the problems of sitting at the end. Um, I'd, just, I'd go back to Lunkerty, if I may. I did a little bit of door knocking there recently, and there's one or two points came across because the report says people are, are happy with this, but there are one or two things. Um, when the thing becomes permanent, if it does, will the signs be timed? Because that was what a lot of the residents were saying. People come into the area, profess not to know they shouldn't be there at that particular time. And I've got another question, but I'll just ask you one at a time. Last one. They are timed. Um, the signs are, they come on at um, quarter past eight till uh, nine o'clock in the morning, and then they're on for 45 minutes in the afternoon. There is no uh, advisory sign that tells you when they're operational. Um, there is information on our website, um, but that's something that when I was in Edinburgh that I learned from that, um, that they had advisory signs um, outside their schools. So fair enough, they had the big wigwag signs that um, notified when it was on, but they also had a supplementary plate um, that gave information of the times of operation. Um, and that's something that we could explore if, if, if we feel that, that, that there is merit in doing that. Well, I, I think it, it might help. Uh, the other thing is that uh, what is also happening in Marshall Road is that there is some parking on the pavement. Now, um, it's not necessarily part of the scheme, but I mean, is there a possibility that maybe Bollard could be put there? Because there's actually a blind lady there who has terrible difficulty as she walks past the school because there's usually cars parked and it's people who come in in the morning and park all day. So that's something... Uh, you know, would you take that on board? Um, and the other thing is about enforcement, because some of it is onto Marshall Way. Mm. Now, because that's a long curve, it doesn't need many cars there to really be quite hazardous. So is that something you will discuss with the police and, uh, you know, draw it to their attention particularly <coughs> so that when they do enforce, they will look at Marshall Way as well as Marshall Road? Yeah, that's something that we can certainly discuss with Police Scotland. Councillor Ling, I think you have asked a question. Yeah, but, but it was, it was oh. following on, on for that, because I'm looking at the map here, and uh, the roads, we've put, the paths we've put in are, as I said earlier, and Councillor Jarvis is agreeing, they're, they're on a corner, on a, on a long road. So if, if we were to incorporate Marshall Way, where are you asking these people to park? I, I, I do not think there's any question of making this onto Marshall Road. Do you want to comment? I mean, we can certainly look at Marshall Way. Uh, I, I mean, I, I'm not looking to no. uh, uh, enlarge the, the school exclusion zone. I'm happy with where it is at the moment. Um, but we're, we're more than happy to go out and have a look at um, if there are issues that are um, being raised by local um, residents there. Um, I'm happy to undertake a site visit with both of you um, if you felt there was merit in doing that. That's fine, but I wasn't asking Marshall Way to be included. No, I'm saying, no, but no. if there's if there is a problem with Marshall Way, where, where apart from Marshall Way could the people park? I, I don't think it's actually saying there is a, a problem with Marshall Way. I actually visited Lunkety School last week and there were no cars parked on Marshall Way when I was there. I thought it was really good and I just wished all schools were, were as good as what we actually witnessed that morning. I think Anne was just saying cars parked on the corner. We're not going to resolve all school parking problems in this paper. We're just asked to deal with what's, what's here. So if there are no further questions for Lachlan, I will move this paper. Okay. The paper, hmm? the paper provides information on the four schools which have been used to trial school exclusion zones. Their purpose is to make the streets outside the schools a safer and healthier place for children removing non-essential car trips from outside the school gates and encouraging pupils with their parents to travel actively to and from school and even walk once a week. The report covers a range of data for each site, including living streets, 
property surveys, traffic surveys and parent surveys. The views of the head teachers have all also been sought and are included in the report. And as I said, I have been out to visit two of the sites and can see the benefits that they are bringing. If the locations within the report are approved, the team will start to prepare the traffic regulation order. I am pleased to move the paper. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Robertson, thank you. Uh, thank you, Vice Mayor. I'm happy to, to, to second the paper. Um, and I think it's important we remember the how that this is about trying to encourage people, young people, to, work, to walk to school with their parents, our cycle. And I th it's also, I think it has to be a holistic thing. It can't just be, um, we have to, to try and make the infrastructure around about schools um, suitable for that, with, with more path networks linking into the school. And I was pleased to hear that that's proposed in other areas where this is currently underway. So I'm happy to move the paper, to second the paper, rather. Okay. Any further? Councillor Bailey. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to, purely an observation, I'd like to draw the committee's attention to page 111, the picture of the signs at um, Cooperanga School. I know that this committee previously has discussed the matter of sign clutter and how that mm -hmm. might be distracting for designers, mm -hmm. for drivers, sorry, and I just want to observe purely that there's a lot of statutory information, really important information, that a driver has to take in, especially one from out of the area as they turn into this street and just um, to put, put on record that um, I still have that concern about sign clutter. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Dugan. Yeah, thank you, Vice Convener. I really welcome the paper um, and I welcome the results uh, that we see before us. I'm a little bit disappointed at the reductions that have been observed by people at the school gate. Um, I don't know whether that's because of their... Uh, it's difficult to observe the reductions or... Um, or, or or, or they're genuinely not uh, as much as we would otherwise have hoped. But nevertheless, this is definitely the right way to go, in my view. Um, and I uh, know very keenly that uh, there are uh, many schools, some of which are in my ward, uh, who are looking for something similar. Uh, we've been talking about this for quite a while, and I think, um, as others have said, it's important for these things to be um, evidence uh, led and data informed as we uh, proceed with this type of activity uh, and, that, and therefore the trial is important um, but I think we want uh, when we do review this um, in uh, the autumn uh, at this committee we uh, will look to have um, a, a good list of schools where we're going to introduce this um, and maybe we'd wish to consult officers might wish to consult with those schools no doubt they'll have been in touch with them via councillors and not uh, beforehand anyway, um, but we will uh, seek to, I think we should seek to get as many schools onto this um, as want to be as soon as possible. Um, and uh, because we've been talking about it and elected members have been talking about it in their wards for quite some time, and it appears to be to me for this particular growing uh, uh, and increasingly severe problem outside our schools to be the only uh, tool in our toolkit to try and reverse and then eradicate uh, the problem as people's uh, behaviours change with more uh, wide uh, uh, community changes. The one thing I would uh, finally point out as well is that I would urge people to, um, I think it was a week past Monday, somebody else can figure out what date that was, um, and it was on the Jeremy Vine show um, on Radio 2. Now the BBC, as we all know, is not the go-to source of primary information if your uh, concern is one of accuracy. But nevertheless, this independent contributor uh, pointed out just exactly what um, Councillor Simpson was talking about, that one of the most hazardous places to be in areas of high vehicle pollution is in inside the car. Um, and uh, that feature was one of cars idling outside schools. Mm -hmm. And there can be nothing more potently toxic than an old diesel car idling outside schools. And it's all too uncommon. And if you actually take the car out of the equation, that exposure to that level of potent toxicity wouldn't be tolerated in any other walk of life, yet daily we expose our kids to outside our schools. So this uh, is a very, very important issue that we should take forward with all haste. Thank you for these comments, and I do hope all the drivers of these cars take heed of <coughs> your comments. Well made. Anyone else got any comment they wish to make? So we're quite happy to agree this report as, as is because Councillor Robertson has made a comment about the R and Gas one. Do you wish this community engagement to take place just to find out? Okay, that's, that's fine. There's no commitment. It's just a community engagement. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, moving on. 
now we come to the Perth and Kinross speed limit trial, 20 mile an hour. We shall ask um, Lachlan to introduce this report. Thank you, Vice Convener. Perth and Kinross Council receives many comments from elected members, community councils and local residents about vehicles that are perceived to be travelling at inappropriate speeds through urban areas across Perth and Kinross. The complainants often ask Perth and Kinross Council to consider lowering the speed limit um, that or lowering the speed that vehicles are travelling in urban areas and to consider reducing speed limits from 30 miles an hour to 20 miles an hour. There are a number of locations where <coughs> there are 20 mile an hour speed limits across Perth and Kinross Council, but they're not the scale that we're looking at for this trial. Um, for example, there are no settings where we have 20 mile an hour that cover whole uh, towns. Um, so this trial will allow us um, to collect um, inf further information um, for the preparation of a refreshed um, strategy on 20 mile an hour speed limits. The locations that we're proposing are Errol, Rattray, outside the school, um, Aberfeldy, Dalgan Ross in Comrie, and Kinesswood. The trial will cover all public road network, um, so if there are any private roads, they will not be included in this trial. However, the owners of those roads are welcome to contact us, um, contact our team um, to be considered as part of the trial. Thank you very much, Martin, for the report. Councillor Donaldson, question? Thank you. With your permission, um, I would like to, in a minute to have a separate que question on 2.15, the difference between consultation and notification. But can I ask, first of all, there are going to be five trial areas of differing natures, including Dalgan Ross and, and Comrie. I think there's also going to be trials in, in, from what I can recall, in Garachie and in Letham. But can I ask those trials, will that preclude, preclude over those 18 months trials in other areas? And uh, basically, I'm thinking in particular of Broich, Ro uh, Broich Road in Grief and uh, what the position might be there. Um, the trial considers the five locations. That's what we're, we're, we've come to committee to request, um, is that, we, that you consider these five locations and they're approved. At the moment, we're not considering adding anything else into the trial, um, so it will be those five locations that we've discussed already. Um, what, we will con what we are um, committed to doing is monitoring the other locations. Um, so the likes of Letham, they already have a 20 mile an hour there, and Ganaki. So we would uh, monitor those locations as part of the trial. So that will give us city data as well as rural all locations. Right. I just want to make clear, though, uh, this then you're effectively saying or not, this would preclude the introduction, or would it not, uh, of 20 mile an hour limits in other areas? It would preclude, yes. Over the next 18 months? Yes. So 20 mile an hour in Broad Road would not be uh, allowed? There's a part-time mandatory there at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, that has that um, operates um, when the school's on. Yeah, yeah, yes, I'm aware of that. But but as a more general application, that would not be permitted over that period, over the next 18 months. Obviously, there's issues of Broad Road because we still don't know yet. The ward councils have met, but hopefully, we're going to know soon the actual start updates of the the work on the, on the junction of Broad uh, of Broad Road and King Street and Burrell Street. We're here to discuss these five at the moment. Keith will answer the point he wants to make. Thank you, Lachlan. Uh, thanks, Vice Convener. Yes, um, the, the evidence around the effectiveness of 20 mile an hour zones is not clear. What we're looking to do is pick these sites, see what, it, uh, what the, the evidence comes out from a Perth and Cross scenario. Um, as we've already um, discussed at committee today, there's quite a lot of resource intensive activity for the team to deliver on. Um, so we want to focus on these five sites, make a, an assessment in terms of the effectiveness of 20 mile, mile an hour zones within um, Perth and Cross around these five sites and then um, take it from there. The report also alludes to a private member's bill um, which is going through a, a, a process within the Scottish Parliament around 20 mile an hour zones which um, depending on outcome of that could be a bit of a game changer anyway. So there's, there's, it's quite a, a fluid situation so that's why we're focusing on these particular sites, Councillor Donaldson. <coughs> Clarification between 
consultation and yeah it's on thank you very much uh, on a separate issue 2.15 um, and it's got all elected members in the wards in which the trials will take place have been consulted with uh, in actual fact we and I asked about this earlier we got an email on the 9th of March uh, I'm thinking particularly Dalgan clearly Dalgan Ross and Comrie um, I, and that just to me doesn't seem to be to be consultation it's basically notification and can I just also ask with the communities that came up at Com I brought it up at Comrie Community Council last Thursday night but just what the statutory consultation will involve. Keith will answer that question. If I may, Vice Convener, I'll, I'll try and deal with the first part, um, Councillor Donaldson, and then perhaps refer to colleagues for the second part, which is a bit more um, technical. Um, I think there's a, a recognition from within the service that, um, that, that w we need to be clear in terms of informing, consulting, and engaging. Um, we are proposing a report to come to the Strategic Policy and Resources Committee um, in, in the next round. Um, which is setting out as a potential pilot for the council around um, these activities with a, a set of parameters by which, which we mean when we deliver these activities. And I think that gives more clarity. So I, I think it's a bit of a learning point for us in general in relation to all of our activities. So I think uh, we, we do take your, your point on board, Councillor Donaldson. Right, I appreciate that comment because certainly the email I got, it was notification, not consultation. Thank you. Last thing, we'll talk about the statutory con consultation. Um, we'll go through the, the, the formal TRO, t TRO process um, for the order, so that um, any consultation that, that, is, that we're expected to follow, we will follow as part of our duties. Thank you very much, Vice Convener. I, I admit to being something of a sceptic about the wider use of 20 mile an hour zones, but um, I accept that my view is perhaps relatively uninformed, and so I welcome the trials. Um, can I ask, though, my, my question relates to paragraph 2.2 .2 on page 133. It, it says the trials will last up to 18 months. Um, are they intended to last for 18 months? And, and if there is, if you like, freedom them, for them to last less than that, what might be the circumstances in, in which they are curtailed? Thank you. Yes, um, what we're looking to do is um, undertake surveys. Um, so we'd like to do them before the, the zones go in place uh, or the, before the trials go in place um, during the trial at two points. Um, the up to 18 months is the maximum time that we can, we can do a trial for, um, but we'd hope to report back before that period. Um, so we would hope to report roughly around the 12 month period, um, which will allow um, the elected members on the committee to see how successful it has been or unsuccessful as the case may be, and to decide whether we want to take them forward as a permanent order or revoke them and revert back to um, the speed limits that are currently there. Thanks, convener. It's just to seek clarity on the, um, the, the schematics that we have show a fairly comprehensive application of a proposed 20 mile an hour, with the exception of Rattray, which seems to be very modest um, and it's just to understand why it's um, essentially outside the school and Honeyberry Drive and uh, New Road. I wonder why, I'm sure there's very good reasons why we couldn't have continued out Hatton Road and Balmoral Road and down Boat Bray um, and into Ferguson Park and Davy Park. I don't know why we seem to have done that in other areas, but not in Rattray. So it's just to try and find out why that is. Uh, we wanted to focus on around the school site in this one. Um, the Parent Council, um, the Pup Pupil Council, and Police Scotland had come um, forward to us, um, so we thought we would include this um, as a proposal, um, which would then allow them um, a, a longer area for enforcement around the school um, and make it safer for the children who want to travel to and from school. Can I have a supplementary? Yes. Convenient? Is, is the Well Meadow around, is the Well Meadow 20 miles an hour currently? Yes. So I, I just, it's, just a, it's just a thought that that couldn't that then present problems? So you're coming in from Ailiff at 30, then you're going down to 20, then you're back up to 30 to go down Boat Bray, then you're back down to 20 for the Well Meadow. Is that, is that not a bit problematic? Uh, we'll ensure that the, the signing is adequate for that. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Vice Convener. I was just, just for clarity, I was trying to get establish, are we talking about establishing uh, 20 mile an hour speed zones or 20 mile an hour speed limits? Because people are talking about zones and according to the, the paper you've, uh, you've highlighted here, there is a difference between zones and limits. One's more effective than the other. Um, in, in the case of this trial, we were going for limits. So it will be a 20 mile an hour limit. So that will be uh, include all the signage that will be um, that will go up as part of that. Thank you. Um, could I ask about um, the proposal for Aberfeldy, for example, is to, for the whole town to be 20 mile, 20 mile an hour limits, and um, it's actually it's got arterial roads running through it, which. Um, which is similar to Kineswood, for example, but Kineswood, I know, has got narrow, very narrow pavements and a very narrow road. So um, why, have, why is it decided to have the, all the main roads going through Aberfeldy reduced to 20? Is there a particular reason why you're wanting to do that? We wanted to trial a whole town um, and we felt that Aberfeldy was a good location for that. Um, we've had a lot of dialogue with the safety group up there. They were, they, they've been, had a lot of dialogue with our team. Um, so we wanted to try it um, and see, is it feasible for us to do that in, in, in the long run? Um, so it's all about data collection. That's what we want to do is collect the data, collect our evidence base. I mean, it might not be suitable um, to, to do that, um, but without doing a trial like this, we're, we're not gonna have the evidence base to, to help us um, moving forward. And particularly if we want to develop a 20 mile an hour strategy or, or look at um, reviewing that, I think we need to have the, the information behind it so that we can make an informed decision going forward. Uh, it was, uh, can I say that the, uh, my question actually was the same as Councillor Parrott's and it has been properly answered, so thank you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Vice Convener. Um, <coughs> I'm really pleased to see this report coming forward because uh, we've waited a wee while for it and. I actually wrote to the convener last November saying, where are we with it? Because getting requests for 20 mile an hour limits. Um, so earlier, I think Lachlan said that they would hope to bring the trials to a conclusion earlier. Uh, I would feel that that would be good if you could. I was wondering about suggesting a shorter period uh, I don't know where the 18 months comes from. 18 months was a trial for the last paper, and you said that's the maximum period. So if it could be done earlier, I would welcome that because it would enable us to look at others. And just picking up on Councillor Robertson's point um, about Aberfeldy being a, a 20 mile an hour zone, it seems to me that Kineswood has the same claim to that. I can only see one road in Kineswood that's not actually going to be part of this scheme and that's Back Dykes Road. Is there a reason for that? Yes, that's a private road. Oh, right. um, so if the residents up there want to be included as part of that, um, they can get in touch with our team and we can certainly include them. Thanks very much. Thanks, Vice Convener. Uh, it's 1.7 and I know it's only for noting the ones that I have already got, 20 man out. 20 mile an hour speed limits. I was wondering, do we have any feedback or information for that? Because the Dunkeld one covers quite a bit of Dunkeld. Um, we can certainly include them as part of the trial and getting feedback from um, other um, locations. Um, I mean, we've done speed surveys over the years, but it might be an opportunity for us to go out and look at established zones um, and do um, s traffic counts there as well and see what the speeds are like as well. Yeah. It might have been helpful if we just had a little bit of that information showing the, the effects that although it's limited, we could have seen you know, what's happening in these areas that already have the 20 mile an hour limits. So I, I think that what Lachlan was saying is that we don't actually have that information at the moment, you know, sort of, but we can, um, you know, sort of what, what the paper is recommending that for some areas that we would do, you know, sort of um, listed in 1.7, we would actually do those um, traffic counts and the speed counts. Um, and what Lachlan, <coughs> I think, is suggesting is we could include Dunkeld in that as well for information. Um. No further questions? Well, Lachlan, thank you very much for answering all the questions. And I would like to 
moved the pier curve. This report outlines the areas where there are currently 20 mile an hour speed limits in place and details of where the service is proposing to introduce new ones on a trial basis for up to 18 months. If approved, the traffic and network team will start to prepare the traffic regulation order for the sites agreed for the trial. During this time period, the traffic and network team will undertake traffic surveys to monitor vehicle speeds and will report back to committee in due course on the outcome of the trial. I am happy to move the paper. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Macaulay. Bar Macaulay. Oh. Um, no, I'm, I'm happy to second <coughs> Vice Convener. Um, I'm, I know there in uh, many people that have spoken to me have stated that they have varying views on whether uh, 20 mile an hour limits are uh, necessary and enforceable and others think they're absolutely wonderful and I think it's wonderful that we're bringing forward the ability for us to gain the evidence to, uh, to actually be able to answer the questions that's what's best for Perth and Kinross and I'm happy to second the paper. Thank you. Open up for comments. Councillor Duff. Thank you, Vice Convener. Um, I should say I welcome the report. I'm aware that uh, much work has been done on the subject of road safety and speed surveys within Aberfeldy by the Community Council. Uh, they have recorded a large number of vehicle journeys over the um, last 12 months or so, probably. Um, and it has shown that a sizable percentage of the vehicle journeys recorded have been above the speed limit, whether that's 30 miles an hour or 20 miles an hour throughout the town. And uh, even in the, um, the uh, temporary zone out with the out outside the school. So I'm quite certain that uh, the Community Council and the residents of Aberfeld will also welcome this proposal. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Councillor Robertson. I also uh, welcome this uh, report and I think it's really good that we've, we've got to this stage. Um, in the, the, the previous convener of uh, this committee was, I think, not in favour of the introduction of 20 mile an hour limits. In fact, I had a, I remember at one committee, I had a very long argument with them trying to get one introduced at Glenlomond Village in Kinrosha. And eventually, after about 20 minutes arguing, he agreed to do a trial at Glenlomond. And someone in the committee then said, how long will the trial last? And I said, at least 20 years. <laughs> so um, I'm, ho I'm hoping that the trial areas prove <coughs> successful and that um, we will not be taking them away because I think once they're intro introduced, it does make residents feel safer. I, I know from evidence it doesn't always lead to a huge reduction in speeds, but it does make residents feel safer and hopefully it will prevent accidents. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Dugan, I think you were speaking. Thanks, Vice Commissioner. Great news. I uh, think it's very important. Good to see it. I'd like to see it in more places. I'm a convert to 20 mile an hour speed limits. I remember the episode that um, the councillor uh, Robertson has gone on about, and he did go on and on about it at that time, fair play to him. Um, and, uh, but nevertheless, I think uh, people's perceptions have moved on. I think our knowledge and the data around this has moved on, and I think it's right that we as a local authority are taking this uh, forward with renewed um, enthusiasm uh, for the benefit of local communities, where that's appropriate. Thank you. Any other comments? Councillor Simpson. Thank you very much indeed, Vice Commissioner. Uh, for the second time today, I find myself in the unusual position of agreeing with absolutely everything Councillor Dugan says. I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to mark my calendar when I get back up to my office. That's alarming. Um, I, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm puzzled by this report because I, what I can never understand is, is why people would want to speed past shops and schools <laughs> and parks and places where kids are playing. And I can't see why there should be any reason why people would object to driving 20 miles an hour. I note at 1.2 uh, on page 1C1, the, the World Health Organization report, and I see that um, 1.35 million deaths are attributed worldwide to traffic accidents. I would, and I would suggest that if this was anything else causing that amount of death and destruction, that there would be a huge amount of uh, public interest, a lot of inquiries about it. It's the leading killer of people between the ages of 5 and 29 in the world. And why anyone would want to not to drive slowly and not drive carefully it is beyond me. Um, on, on Keith's point about um, evidence as to whether it makes any actual difference, it is my understanding there's a fair bit of good quality evidence from Edinburgh and Glasgow that the people in these areas feel much, much safer and are therefore in more inclined to, tr act, to actively travel and to cross roads and use the roads. And if we can do that, that could be a yet another benefit. So this is it's a great report, and I look forward to being rolled out as far as possible. Mm -hmm. 
move on now to paper nine, the City of Perth um, Winter Festival. Winter is now past, this is into the into spring equinox, so it's a good time to talk about it. I forgot. Okay, um, thank you, Vice Convener. As the members will be aware, each year a report on the Winter Festival is submitted to an early meeting of this committee. As is the custom, the report outlines the background and development of the festival and its core elements with particular summaries of the larger events, the Christmas Lights event and the Riverside Light Nights, and outlining any year-to-year -year changes or developments in the program and a financial breakdown and estimated impact of the events. In the case of the Christmas Lights event, based on the visitor survey data and the estimated attendance at this year's event, the net additional expenditure has been calculated at 1.9 million pounds. With regards to the Riverside Light Nights, a visitor survey was undertaken on the two Burns-themed evenings which opened the programme. For those two evenings, the estimated net additional expenditure generated has been estimated at £230,000. Going forward, it is proposed that the Winter Festival and its resourcing requirements are considered in line with the, a refreshed event strategy and the budget process, and that there will be further engagement with elected members on the design and delivery of the Winter Festival programme as well as the business community. The report concludes with an overview of the free festive parking initiative, which was applied in PKC managed car parks across Perth and Kinross on Saturdays in December and following approval by this committee in November last year. Although the number of responses to the business survey is small, that initiative is generally well received by businesses which recognize the value of the project in what is a very challenging time for the retail sector. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan, for the report. Are there any questions on this report? Councillor Robertson. I would like to resign the way you said that, uh, <laughs> Vice Convener. Um, I, 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 I unfortunately have a number of questions about this. Um, and I'll start with, um, I, I don't understand how, um, at the the total cost of this is £431,000, which by any stretch of anyone's imagination is a huge amount of money, um, all spent within the city of Perth. Um, my questions are as follows. Why have we not recouped more of the cost of this? Um, for example, out of the 431000 only 16% of the costs have actually been recouped from a presumed sponsorship or people taking up stances in the various events. Um, so can I have a, 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 a response to that? That's, uh, we, 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 even with the 16% recouping of the cost, it's still an out, outlaying <coughs> cost of nearly £363,000. £363,000, that's a huge amount of money. <laughs> so please, could I have a response to that? I think Keith's going to speak Thanks. first. Uh, thanks, Vice Convener. Yes, um, the event programme is based on our event strategy, and as Alan outlined in the introduction, um, we are, we're currently reviewing, or we're about to review our event strategy. Um, it's based on free access to these events. Um, I think if uh, the well, we, we do have income generation targets um, for um, our event programme, which has been programmed into the, the budget. I think it's a different proposition if we charge everybody for everything, um, but that's obviously one of the factors to be considered as part of the um, review of the event strategy. Um, I think the approach that's been taken through the event strategy and our events approach and the, the increasing number of, of people have actually come to um, um, the, the city centre for these activities. One, it gives profile for the area. One, it br uh, secondly, it brings in people from um, around the, the um, uh, United Kingdom. We've evidence of, of more people coming from um, different parts of the UK for this. And the key issue is the net benefits for the area. Um, the the, the, the 1.96 million pounds, as, as Alan hi highlighted earlier on there. So. Um, we can look at income generation, but if, if the, the game plan is full cost recovery, that becomes a totally different proposition to what we've delivered over the, the past number of years. And I think there's challenges around that, such as uh, if we are talking about growing visitor numbers to the area and we get the net benefit to the, um, uh, uh, the nightlife, et cetera, within per city centre, that could be a challenge as people may choose to vote with their feet and not go for free, free events. There's also, because of the nature of the Winter Festival being the city centre, it's very difficult to recruit 
physically fenced off areas where we can actually charge people. But we are, we are as part of the, the event strategy, looking forward to things like um, some of the income that we've generated is through sponsorship. And I think there's uh, maybe opportunities around that. There's um, perhaps in, in, uh, opportunities around things like crowdfunding, crowdsourcing, so where people can pay, they, 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 they would. I think the other key thing about um, um, the, the um, Winter Festival and indeed our events programme is, is fear for all, so there's a fairness and equality for all and giving every, everybody an equal chance to, to come on board with it, as opposed to charging, which might be more challenging. So it's a complex mix. We're not ignoring the challenge that you're putting out there, but there are other dimensions to what we're, what we're doing, and we're, we're taking that on board through the, the event strategy, and as Alan mentioned earlier on, we will be consulting elected members on that. Um, Myself and Councillor McCall have actually been tasked by the administration to try and look at finding ways to, to, to make, to gen, generate extra income. And then if, if I was thinking when I read this report, if, if we could actually make even, if we even get to like 40% cost recovery, it would make such a difference. Um, but so that's the first thing I want to ask. The second thing I want to ask is about the, um, there was an event in Kinross there is a, an event in Kinross called the Mira Kunis Scots Day, which is a, a, an ongoing event. Now, um, but it needs, it, needs, it needs funding to, to try and keep it going, um, support funding. When it applied to the council for, for support, it was told that our event strategy only allowed um, support to new events and not to existing events. So they were refused. Um, this is an existing event, but it gets funding. So could you explain what the difference is between the two events? This is a council run event, you know, sort of, and the event strategy is very clear, Councillor Robertson, that, you know, sort of, that it's a twofold, you know, sort of approach within that, and that's about the council attracting other events, you know, sort of, which last year, you know, sort of included the biggest weekend with the BBC at Schoon Palace. But it's also, you know, sort of about growing our own. And, you know, sort of the Winter Festival is a huge, um, you know, sort of part of growing our own events, you know, sort of. Um, and that, I would imagine, you know, sort of Alan um, Graham can confirm will be an ongoing part of our event strategy. But to go back to your um, earlier point as well, you know, sort of this covers, you know, sort of 23 nights and days within the, the Winter Festival. If you average that out, it's £16,000 an event, which I don't think is particularly particularly large. We have to consider, you know, sort of, as Keith has said, you know, sort of, that um, the economic development, you know, sort of, and the economic benefits, you know, sort of, um, Perth has to be seen as a big driver for that. And David, you know, sort of, and Alan will be able to confirm the, the impact that, you know, sort of, Perth in particular has across the, old, the whole area. But we understand the concerns and, you know, sort of, and the events of the revised event strategy will pick that up as well. Right, this, is, this is my third and final question. So, uh, can I take it that should other areas like, say, Creep or Off the Rarder or, or Blair Gowrie or Kinross want to organise an event on a smaller scale to this, that there's a very good chance that the money could be forthcoming to, to make it happen. There are two pots of money available, you know, sort of the council as well as the, the, the council run events, you know, sort of, of which the Winter Festival is a big part of that. Then, you know, sort of, there are, you know, sort of, the co there's the core budget, um, you know, sort of, and that is split equally between events that take place in Perth and <coughs> events that take place out with, you know, sort of Perth as well. Um, and any, you know, sort of um, organisation can apply for that. There is also the £100,000 for the rural events that was put into the budget last year by the administration, and that funding has been carried forward. Okay. Councillor, next please, Ken, Councillor Simpson. Uh, it, was, it was just a point of clarity on Councillor uh, Robertson's comment about that it was only for new events, but that was administration's instructions when they put the 100000 in the budget. It was for new rural events. It wasn't for existing ones. Is that correct? Thank you, Vice Convener. Um, I have a query concerning the transport in and out to these events. So I'll, I'll spare the committee my, my opinion on free parking, but I just wondered if we've given any consideration to either uh, a park and ride shuttle bus service to bring people in and encourage more people to come in, and also to subsidize um, bus travel. If a family is coming in, say, from Letham on the bus, 
that you'd be kissing goodbye to 25 or 30 quid in the bus fares if there's if a big family. Um, and that's, that's enough to in fact, make this less inclusive as, 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 um, as we've been told. So I think there may be other things we could look at to encourage more people to come in. And I just wondered if we'd given thoughts to park and ride shuttle buses or special offer bus fares. Vice Convener, yeah, I think um, we, we want to review these as part of our event strategy review council, Simpson. So uh, we, we've not necessarily done a lot of that in, in the past, but I, th I think it's um, having the event strategy is that opportunity as we have more and more people um, who want to be coming to these events, which is great, um, but there is that challenge of people getting in, so we're happy to take that away. Thank you, Roger, Vice Convener. Um, th th there's a sensible limit to the number of events that we can lay on and we want those that we do lay on to be as successful as possible. Um, my question relates to paragraph 3.2 on page 153 and 3.5 on page 154 and um, I'm in fairness I'm, I'm not looking for the answer now but I'm, I find it hard to understand that the, the day visitor spend is, is 49 pounds per person and the overnight visitor spend is 358 pounds per person um, and, and I don't understand the workings of the income multiplier and, and my question is um, can, I, can it be arranged for myself and anyone else who's interested to better understand a briefing to better understand the methodology by which these figures are calculated and, and how they are derived. Thank you. Uh, yes, we can uh, certainly arrange that. The, um, obviously, the, the calculation um, is derived from primary uh, input data from the visitor survey, so it relies on that and has been consistent with the previous years as well, so that we have continuity over the previous years of the Winter Festival, but we can certainly arrange a briefing with members on the, the model um, and with the con potentially with the consultant that uh, we've used for that purpose. Thank you, Vice Convener. My question was precisely the same as Councillor Parrott's, and it's good to have the reinforcement that I got the maths right as well because our numbers are matching. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vice Convener. Um, I appreciate the work that officers have done in this. I think we've spent five or so years building this event, and I appreciate clarity given the ca capacity constraints of the city centre. If, uh, certainly in terms of the light switch on, or building these events, but certainly in terms of the light switch on, if we are having reached maximum capacity, if we're now in the, in the process of consolidating and ma uh, making this ever more sustainable, if that is the case, um, I've had discussions with officers in the past about the potential for sponsorship of key events within the Winter Festival, um, and I realise these might um, not be able to be discussed openly, but um, can I ask uh, if they are, uh, how, how, how far progressed they are, and if officers can give any indication of whether or not that is actually a market that exists for us? I think it's a fair point, Councillor Dugan. I think that th there is a market in as much as we have noticed more sponsorship, even the, the, the night lights um, um, uh, the last month um, had, had a higher level of sponsorship than we've had before. I think there's opportunities to take that one further. Again, as part of what we want to do with the event strategies, tie that into um, the, the opportunities for um, um, sponsorship and taking that um, further forward. Cause to me, that's, that's probably more, more fertile opportunity than perhaps direct charging. But that's my opinion. Are there any more questions? If not, I would like to thank Alan and Keith for answering the questions, and I would like to, to move this report. Over the past few years, the Winter Perth Winter Festival has grown significantly in scale and scope, with attendances at Christmas lights and Riverside light nights growing to an estimated 150,000 over the course of the two events. We know that people are travelling greater distances to come to see both. The economic impact of the Winter Festival events programmes, key events alone, the Christmas lights and the Robert Burns themed light nights has been assessed and suggested an estimated net additional expenditure of over two million. A link to the Winter Festival is the free festive parking initiative which the Council introduced in a bid to boost visitation to Perth and their towns in the pre-Christmas period. 
This scheme has been refined over recent years and now extended to all council managed car parks in Perth and Kinross for Saturdays in December. The report highlights that the scheme appears to be appreciated by businesses who do feel that it encourages customers to stay longer, that is positive for their business and would be keen for this to be t maintained. I'm happy to move the paper to have a seconder. Councillor McCall. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Convener. I'm more than happy to second this paper. Um, I think it highlights exactly uh, what we've done exceptionally well. I think it is a massively good news story. Um, could you imagine what it would be like if we were sitting here looking at the expenditure and didn't have the, the volume of people coming to visit us and the spend that is reported? Um, we would be sitting here um, saying how horrific it was. This is actually an exceptionally good thing for Perth and Kinross. Um, I think um, we have done this exceptionally well and it has shown over the past few years just how we have taken this festival and expanded it and expanded it to make it into something that is unique and spectacular, that is the envy of uh, most of the other cities in Scotland. So I actually uh, think this is an excellent paper and I'm happy to second. Thank you. Any comments? Councillor Duggan. Yeah, just following on from the seconder of the paper, this is a tremendous uh, achievement for Perth and Kinross and complacency has got no room in the review of these events. You know, this doesn't, ju this doesn't just happen. You know, this is the result of year on year building on success and compounding achievement. You know, the, the lineup of last year's light switch on mm -hmm. was for many people initially unbelievable. They literally couldn't believe that these acts were going to come to Perth to perform. Nothing has put Perth on the map in the way that the Winter Festival has over the last five years. Uh, and, and I'm very, very concerned to hear um, people uh, 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 wince about, about the price of it. Uh, this is economic driving activity for Perth and Perth and Kinross. It might be located in Perth and Kinross, but it's accessible to a greater or lesser extent with many um, different varying factors um, to everybody in Perth and Kinross. And the city is not full of people from Perth because there's twice as many people come as live in mm -hmm. Perth for the light switch on. They're coming from all Earths and Perths, across the Shire and across Scotland. And in fact, I think I'm right in saying there was actually a whole busload of people came up from Manchester last year mm -hmm. uh, for, the, um, uh, for the light switch on. So it's important that if you only have a binary and black and white view of the world, you perhaps take a back seat from reviewing these types of things because you have to be open-minded and ambitious to drive things like this forward. So I'm very uh, heartened to hear uh, Councillor McCall on behalf of the administration speak positively about this uh, and, and therefore I hope that it continues uh, to grow in its success and uh, finally wish to accord uh, once again my appreciation and uh, admiration really for the way officers have delivered um, such a tremendously successful event on what is an actual fact in the grand scheme of things a relatively modest budget. Thank you very much Councillor Duggan. Councillor Robertson. We have. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you. Like to make we comment. already have an income target across all of the events for this year for 75, or for the next financial year of 75,000 pounds, and for the following year of 150,000 pounds. So we're working on this anyway. Um, and I personally don't think we need it to add that recommendation, but it's up to committee. I'm happy with the report as it is, without any further recommendations. Any further comments, Councillor Duff? Uh, thank you, Vice Convener. Uh, you know, I, I hear the, the comments about costs and defraying costs and sponsorship and such like, uh, and agree with that. However, I, I wouldn't like the press to take away any thought that uh, you know this wasn't a good news story. If I understand the figures and the complexity of the, the figures in the paper correctly, and the follow-up work done in the two biggest events, we have invested a net £185,000 in the Christmas lights and gained £2 million for the economy and 107,000 in the light nights um, and gained 230,000 pounds for the economy. And uh, by anybody's standards, that has to be good news. Thank you. I, I too would like to make a comment and I share every, all the comments that Councillor Duggan made. It's actually, it's, it's actually great to be in Perth on the Christmas light nights and meet people from all over who are singing the praises of all that's gone on and it's been well managed and um, I think it's really good, good news for Perth and I just hope that they continue to get 
class acts again for this year. I'd like to thank, record my thanks to all the officers who make it possible because, as Councillor Dugan says, it doesn't just happen and it's not just a one-day wonder. They work on it night and day, so thank you all. active travel strategy we've certainly talked a lot about active travel and roads today now we come to a few simple papers which I am just going to leave without any comment unless I have any questions on it Councillor Bailey you have a question in this room um, I'm a regular user of this footpath in Insure and just a quick question on behalf of a primary four pupil in Insure Primary School do we have an updated date for the works to start? I know this is about the traffic regulation order, but the, the works on the ground were delayed from February. Do we know when we'll be starting work? I don't know if there's anyone here who can actually... Oh, wait, yes, Brian. Brian. Um, thank you, uh, Vice Convener and Collector Members. Um, there is no programme date yet, but hopefully as early as possible in the new financial year. It's certainly on our radar to, to deliver this as quickly as possible. It's been a project that uh, we've had aspirations to deliver for a couple of years now, and we're now at a stage where we feel we can deliver it and the funding's in place. Thank you, Claire. No further questions on this report? Well, I'm happy to, to move this report. Okay, we'll move on now to... The proposed 30 mile and 40 mile speed limits at Red Gorton. Any concerns about this? I'd be happy just to bring this report. And we have the panel of this one, the proposed taxi rank clearway Murray Street. And agreed. The last one. I missed one here. That's it. Right, okay. Yeah. Now, before we move into um, the private se session, I've got one pleasant duty few more words the gentleman sitting at long at the end he's been very quiet not saying a word <laughs> uh, who is he who is he he's actually gone in this new look with the beard which kind of i don't know whether this is for his new lifestyle that we know nothing about <laughs> it's back to, to be santa for the christmas episode there we go <laughs> that's it that's the first thing <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> As you will be aware, Willie Young, Head of Environmental and Consumer Services, is due to retire at the end of this month, and I would like to take the opportunity to reflect on his career. Willie attended school. <laughs> <laughs> Caught you all out. <laughs> In Cumbernauld, but left without any formal qualifications and worked as a tractorman, farm labourer in Dunning and Merthyn, before becoming a sawmiller in Errol, a Boyne and Dunkeld. And Willie started <coughs> work with the council as a road sweeper in Pitlochry in July 1992. Some of you can't remember as far back as that. On a six week temporary contract, becoming permanent in August that year. His starting salary was three pound 31 an hour with a 23% bonus. Now, I don't know how that was calculated, but I'm sure somebody's going to tell me. <laughs> but I'm pretty, cert <laughs> I'm pretty certain if it was due to hard work and forward thinking, Willie wouldn't have been paid his bonus every time. He quickly moved through the ranks, waste disposal operator in January 1993, charge hand in June 1994, senior charge hand in August 1995, Foreman in April 1997, Supervisor in December 1998, Waste Management Officer in January 2003, Operations Coordinator in August 2004, Direct Services Manager in June 2007, and then finally becoming Head of Service November 2015. A great example of growing your own if ever there was one. <laughs> I'm sure that I will not be wrong in saying that there are very few in the council who've learned their trade from the very bottom to the top. Equally, I'm sure that by doing this, there is no hiding place for anyone else in that team. 
as Willie will have known all the tricks of the trade, his career has been truly inspirational and a testament to his hard work and determination. He is an excellent team player and well known to us all for his commitment and solving problems, communicating issues and not being afraid to say no to us in a way that we don't take offence, quite a feat. This is summed up by Keith's reference for Willie when he became the direct services manager. It is common knowledge, if you want something done quickly, efficiently and without fuss, then Willie is the person to contact. He's the embodiment of a can-do culture. I can't think of anything more true or fitting to say except to add, Willie, we will miss you and I'm sure you all want to join me in thanking him for his 26 years and a half service with the council and wishing Willie a long and happy retirement. Like to say a few words. Just a few. My man, very little words, as you probably realise, over the time I've been sat at this committee. Um, one of the key things that uh, Catherine just said that it was a six week contract, temporary contract way back in 1992. And probably in hindsight, that's probably was maybe one of the mistakes the council made that they actually made it permanent. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thoroughly enjoyed myself with Perth and Ken Ross. Uh, we were out. So a couple of weeks ago, uh, colleagues for the SNT just for a nice meal in, in Northport, and one of the questions was asked is, is there anything you're going to miss? Kind of like that from here when you retire. And I told him, the main thing for me is, 98% of me, I'm quite happy to go, I just feel it's time, and it's just right for me to go. Small part of me will be sad, and the main thing is, is the, it's the, the interaction you get on a daily basis with members, with your staff, and with members of the community. Um, and that's the bit you'll miss. That's the that's, that's bit I'll be genuinely honest I'll miss. Apart from that, I'm quite happy to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got uh, next week to go, finishing the 29th. I'd just like to thank Catherine for the kind words and that, and uh, wish the committee and everybody here all the best in the future. Thank you. We shall now move into the private session, so anyone who's not required is free to go.